let's take a look at nuclear physics and binding energy. And to begin with, we're going to introduce a vocabulary word, and that is nuclide. A nuclide is a nucleus with a specific number of protons and neutrons. And to show you how this word is different from element and isotope, I'm going to write down four different nuclei. Nickel 60, nickel 58, iron 56, and iron 57. So I would say that these four are different nuclides. They're different nuclides because each of these has a different number of protons and neutrons. But I would say that for the two nickels, these are isotopes of the element nickel. They're both of the element nickel because they have the same number of protons, but they're isotopes because they have different numbers of neutrons. And likewise, over here, I would say that iron 56 and iron 57 are both isotopes of the element iron. They're both of the element iron, but they're isotopes of iron because they have different numbers of neutrons. Now, why are we concerned about all of this? Why are we so worried about the numbers of protons and the number of neutrons? Well, to understand why, we're going to think about the forces within a nucleus. So I'm going to draw sort of a picture, a cartoon, of a carbon-12 nucleus. So if it's carbon-12, there are six protons and six neutrons. And if we think about the forces that are present, well, there's definitely going to be a force of repulsion, because all of these protons have positive charge. And those positive charges are going to repel each other through the electric force, or electrostatic force, or sometimes we call it the Coulomb force. So what is there to oppose this? Because it seems like, just based on the fact that there's protons that repel each other, the nucleus should fly apart. But it doesn't. And the reason it doesn't fly apart is because there is an attractive force between the nucleons. All of the nucleons attract each other. However, they only attract each other at a very, very close range. So if I look at one proton right here, it is attracted only to the nucleons that are very close to it. That force of attraction is something we haven't seen before. It's called the strong nuclear force. And it's a completely different force than we've seen before. It's not a form of gravitational force. It's not a form of electric force or magnetic force. It's a completely different fundamental force. And it only is present between nucleons when they are very, very, very close together, like in the nucleus. So a nucleus is stable when there's a balance between the repulsive Coulomb force between the protons and the attractive strong force between the protons and neutrons, right? Because that doesn't just occur between protons, it occurs between all of the nucleons. Now, if we have too much of one force or the other, then the nucleus is not stable. And if the nucleus is not stable, if, for example, there are too many protons and so there's too much repulsive force, the nucleus will then alter itself to become more stable. Now, we're not going to worry too much about how it will alter itself, this process is called decay. But just know that if it's not stable, the nucleus will find ways to become more stable in many cases. So how could we compare the stability of different nuclides? Well, the more stable the nuclide, the more energy it requires to remove each nucleon. So for example, if I have an unstable nucleus, then, for one reason or another, the nucleons are not strongly stuck together, and it would not require a lot of energy to separate the nucleons completely. On the other hand, if I had a very stable nucleus, then those nucleons are very, very closely connected, and it's going to require a lot of energy to separate the nucleus into its separate nucleons. The amount of energy that's required to separate a nucleus into its individual nucleons is called the binding energy. So the binding energy is the energy required to break apart a nucleus into its individual nucleons. Now, in practice, we don't really think about the binding energy. We think about the binding energy per nucleon. This is a better measure of the true stability of a nucleus, but we'll worry more about that later. So how the heck could we calculate this binding energy? Well, it turns out 
there's a very strange observation that's made about nuclei. Let's say we have a nucleus made up of a certain number of nucleons, and then we compare that to those nucleons when they're separated. Well, you would think that they would have the same mass. I mean, of course they should have the same mass. If I have six protons and six neutrons in a nucleus, and then I have six protons and six neutrons that are not in a nucleus, they should have the same mass. But they don't. It's a very surprising observation, but they don't. It turns out that the six protons and six neutrons, when they are in a nucleus, they combined have less mass than six protons and six neutrons when they're separated. Now, if this is not surprising to you, it really should be. This violates the conservation of mass. And the reason why it happens is because energy and mass are connected. And if that seems a little bit vague, let me be more specific. Energy and mass are connected by E equals mc squared. Now you might guess that this equation is incredibly important and has a lot of different applications. But for the case that we're talking about, for binding energy, if the nucleons are separated, you add an amount of energy to them, which means that their combined mass increases by this corresponding m. And c, by the way, is the speed of light. So if we have a nucleus, and it has a mass m, and then we separate the nucleons, and we find that those separated nucleons have a total mass m plus little m, little m is called the mass defect. It is the difference in the mass between the two states. So when we're talking about the binding energy of a nucleus, if we look at E equals mc squared, the binding energy of a nucleus, E, is equal to the mass defect times c squared. Now before we go any further we have to take a pause and think about units. So if you look at E equals mc squared, E has units of joules, m has units of kilograms, c has units of meters per second. All right, doesn't seem like a problem. However, when we think about nuclei, we're thinking about very very small mass defects and also very small binding energies. So it is common to use a different unit, not the kilogram, but rather something called the unified atomic mass unit, which is represented with a U. A unified atomic mass unit is approximately the mass of a nucleon. It's equal to 1.661 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. For energy, it is customary to use the unit MeV, mega electron volt. Now the mega is just a metric prefix, meaning 10 to the sixth. So a MeV is really 10 to the 6 EV, and an EV is an electron volt. It's defined as the energy that it takes to move the fundamental charge through one volt. It's a very small amount of energy. One EV is equal to 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now maybe those units seem a little bit odd, but you could see why they would be useful. They're very, very small, and so they're useful in nuclear applications. A unit of mass that's also used, however, is the MeV per C squared. Now, how the heck is this a unit of mass? Well, if you look at it, an MeV is an energy unit. And then C squared has units of speed squared, so it's meters squared per second squared. And an energy unit divided by a speed unit squared is a mass unit. If you look at the equation E equals MC squared, you can see how that's true. Now, why would we do that? Why would we ever want to have a mass unit that's MeV per C squared? First of all, it looks more like an energy unit because it has MeV, and then it's got the speed of light just sitting there. How is that useful? Well, don't worry. We'll see in a little bit. Now, back to binding energy. Let's calculate the binding energy of a nuclide. And to do that, I'm going to give you the mass of the nuclide and the mass of the individual particles. So we're going to do lithium-7. Lithium-7, that nucleus, when they're all together, has a mass of 7.016004 U. Remember, U is the unified atomic mass unit. So lithium contains three protons and four neutrons, and the mass of a proton is 1.007276 U. That's in your data booklet. And the mass of a neutron is equal to 1.008665 unified atomic mass units. So if I had 
three protons and four neutrons separated, their total mass would be, well, let's see, uh, their total mass would be 7.056488 unified atomic mass units. And if you look, the mass of the separated nucleons is indeed greater than the mass of the nucleus that contains those nucleons. Now we can find the mass defect now. Remember, the mass defect is the difference in the mass of the two states. So we take the mass of the separated nucleons, and we subtract off the mass of the nucleons when they're together in the nucleus, and that's the mass defect. 0.040484 unified atomic mass units. So that's the mass defect. Remember, to get the binding energy, we have to use E equals mc squared. The binding energy is equal to the mass defect times c squared. However, if you look at this, this is a unit nightmare. We have unified atomic mass units, and then we're going to multiply by meters squared per second squared. That's going to be terrible. The way that we fix that is we're going to take the unified atomic mass unit, and we're going to convert that to a unit of MeV per c squared. That weird mass unit that we had before. And it turns out that one unified atomic mass unit is equal to 931.5 MeV per c squared. So I take that mass defect, which is in U, and convert it to units of MeV per c squared. And if I do that, I get 37.7 MeV per c squared for the mass defect. Now the binding energy is equal to the mass defect times c squared. So my binding energy is equal to 37.7 MeV per c squared times c squared. The c's cancel out, and I'm left with 37.7 MeV. That's the utility of the MeV per c squared. When your mass defect is in units of MeV per c squared, and then you put it into E equals mc squared, the c's cancel out. Now the true measure, I said, of stability is not really the binding energy, it's the binding energy per nucleon. So the binding energy per nucleon of lithium-7 is 37.7 MeV divided by the number of nucleons, which is 7. So the binding energy per nucleon of lithium-7 is 5.39 MeV. Now the reason why we really want binding energy per nucleon is because it gives us an idea of how much energy is required to remove a single nucleon, on average, from the nucleus. So it's not telling us about how to separate all of the nucleons, and of course, if we have 238 nucleons in there, it's going to take more energy. What we really want is the energy per nucleon to remove a nucleon from the nucleus. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a plot of binding energy per nucleon versus number of nucleons, and we're going to do that for only the most stable nuclides. We're not going to do this for the very unstable ones. So if I do that, I get this graph. And I took this graph from Verma's Concept of Physics 2. It's a very nice textbook. I recommend it. And remember, if the binding energy per nucleon is higher, then that means it's a more stable nucleus, because that means it requires more energy to remove a nucleon from the nucleus. So the most stable nuclides are right here at the peak of the graph. And there are less stable nuclides over here on the right. The very high nucleon number nuclides are less stable. And then if I go over here to the very low nucleon number nuclides, they are also less stable. Now this graph at first might not seem very useful. Why does it matter if a nucleus is stable or not? However, it turns out that we will see later that this graph explains a whole lot of phenomena that are very important. We can use this graph to explain how the sun fuses hydrogen. We can use it to explain why stars explode in some cases. We can also use it to explain how nuclear bombs work. It's a very, very useful graph, and we're going to explore some of those things later on in the course.